On Monday, December 11th, New York v. Jonathan Majors entered its sixth day of trial. As always, I will start that if you are not familiar with this case, this is where the prosecutors have alleged that the actor Jonathan Majors on the night of March 24th slash morning of March 25th, 2023, physically assaulted his then girlfriend, Grace Jabari. And also as always, I have linked in the description below to a playlist of videos on the subject so that you can get totally caught up on this trial up to this point. Anyway, on to day six. The day started out with a judge making a determination about whether and to what extent to allow a DV expert to testify on behalf of the prosecution. The court ended up determining that the DV expert would be able to testify as an expert in the dynamics of DV. This means that the judge was allowing in testimony in general terms about the subject and as a proper aid in the jury's understanding of Ms. Jabari's behavior in this case. That said, the judge said that he was not allowing the expert to testify about any psychological diagnoses or to make statements like, because a person exhibited certain behaviors, this means that they are a victim of DV. He also said that the expert could not testify that false allegations of DV are incredibly rare. And this is because statements like that could actually be misleading to the jury since rare occasions do have instances where the rare occasion occurs. And who's to say that this isn't one of them? In other words, testimony about that kind of information isn't necessarily helpful to the jury in making a determination as to what happened in this instance. Anyway, once this was decided, the state put on the next witness. This was Chloe Zoller, who was the woman in the group of strangers that Jabari met on the sidewalk after she pursued majors out of the SUV on the night of the alleged altercation. Ms. Zoller testified that Jabari was visibly upset when they encountered her. She said that Jabari explained to the group that she had just gotten out of a moving vehicle and no longer had her keys, phone, or wallet, and that she had just found out her significant other was cheating on her. While testifying, Zoller was shown video surveillance from their initial contact out there on the sidewalk, and this video was showing her hugging Jabari cheek to cheek and where the two made mutual contact with the right side of their faces. On camera, they apparently did this somewhere between three to five times. And Zoller testified that she did not notice any blood, bleeding, or any kind of injuries on Jabari's right hand or on her right ear. However, Zoller also testified that when they went to the club, Jabari complained that her finger was hurting. This is potentially important because it does give us a timestamp of Jabari complaining about pain. And that timestamp is also coming from a disinterested party. Zoller said that she hasn't even spoken with Jabari since that night, and they're essentially still strangers to each other. Before this, however, Zoller did testify that she was the one that invited Jabari to join them at the nightclub for a birthday party because she says that she was concerned about leaving Jabari behind. Behind. She said Jabari was upset and Zoller knew that Majors was somewhere nearby and she knew that they both lived together. So she was concerned about where that all might lead. Going back to where Jabari was complaining about pain in her right hand, Zoller said that she gave Jabari some ice from a drink bucket on their table to apply to it while they were at the nightclub. She also testified that when they were leaving the nightclub, that Jabari ran into a wall while exiting to get into a cab. Jabari had previously testified that she had brushed past it, but Zoller confirmed that she had actually run into it, and she was also presented with video surveillance of the moment to confirm that. After that, the jury heard from another one of the three strangers that Jabari met on the sidewalk that evening. This was Max Manning. Unfortunately, I couldn't really find all that much about his testimony other than the fact that it was apparently very quick. He apparently described how they had encountered Jabari and how she joined them to go to the nightclub. The defense did ask him on cross-examination if he noticed any injuries on her, and he confirmed that he did not notice any. And I will say, from the video surveillance footage, it does seem that Zoller, the previous witness, had been in closer contact with Jabari than Manning was, so there may not have been much more for him to add on top of what Zoller had already testified. Anyway, after that, the jury heard from Dr. William K. Chang, Jabari's treating physician at Bellevue Hospital. He, of course, testified about Jabari's injuries when she saw him the next day. He said that Jabari had a fracture in her finger without a separation and a cut behind her ear that was a little less than one inch in length. The cut was apparently closed with skin glue. When the prosecution asked, in Dr. Chang's experience, what would cause this type of ear laceration, he responded that it was consistent with being hit in the ear or hitting a sharp object. On cross-examination, the defense asked Dr. Chang if he had asked Jabari how she hurt her finger. And as you can imagine, he said yes. 
Now, Jabari's answer to this question from Dr. Chang is of course, potentially important because remember that the police officer testified previously that it seemed like Jabari was afraid of majors. And it seemed like that was the reason why she wasn't saying how she got hurt since he was just outside the room while she was talking to the officers. The prosecution is, of course, saying that it's much more than that, that Jabari was not just afraid of majors, but that she also was trying to protect majors by not saying how she got hurt. But here, Dr. Chang testified that Jabari told the medical team at Bellevue as well that she did not know how she hurt her middle finger. Dr. Chang also testified that Jabari did not tell the medical team that she was struck in the back of the head. This, of course, could still be consistent with her wanting to protect majors. But for the defense, it could cancel out the supposition by the police that the reason why she was saying that she didn't know how she got her injuries was because she was just afraid of majors. How much you believe these various justifications, of course, is a matter of perspective. And on that, I am interested in your thoughts. So let me know in the comments down below. Now, another thing that the defense asked Dr. Chang about was whether Jabari had anything like cauliflower ear. Now, I had never heard of this term before, so I needed to look this up. Apparently, it's a deformity of the ear that is typically caused by direct blunt force trauma to the ear. According to the Cleveland Clinic, it's common among boxers, wrestlers, and martial artists, which makes sense given the fact that they often experience blunt trauma to their ears, but it apparently can happen to anyone who sustains an injury to their outer ear. And so basically what happens is it makes a person's ear look lumpy and deformed. This happens first when blood vessels tear and start pulling blood, creating a pocket of blood on the ear. This pocket apparently causes the ear's skin to separate from the cartilage that gives the ear its particular shape. Then as the injury heals, your ear apparently folds back in on itself so that the skin comes back next to the cartilage again. But because of the injury, what's left behind is a bit of a shriveled cauliflower-like appearance. As I mentioned, this apparently is common with boxers, wrestlers, and martial artists. And if you look at renowned MMA fighter Dylan Dennis, you can kind of see what this can look like. Anyway, after looking all of this up, it doesn't seem that Dr. Chang would have noticed cauliflower ear on Jabari since it seems that that's what's left behind after the ear has healed from the blunt force trauma. And he saw her, I guess, the next morning after the alleged incident. Granted, injuries and healing timelines can probably vary from person to person, but in my non-expert opinion, it would seem that if she had a blow to the ear, the doctor would probably be looking for swelling at that point in the timeline as opposed to that cauliflower ear appearance that shows up after the ear is finished healing. But hey, I appreciate the opportunity to learn. Now I know what cauliflower ear is. Anyway, back to the cross-examination. Dr. Chang also affirmed here that there's no documentation of any scratches on Jabari's face. He also said that Jabari had no bruising on her face nor on her neck. Next, the defense turned to the question of Jabari's use of alcohol, which Dr. Chang also did an assessment of using an audit C test, which identifies a person as positive or negative for alcohol use disorder. Apparently, Jabari reported that she would have three to four drinks per night, and on a monthly basis, she would have six or more drinks in one sitting. And one of the reports I saw coming out of the courtroom said that she apparently scored a five out of 12. And depending on where you go looking for information on on audit C tests, I've seen that for women, sometimes a three is enough to test positive for alcohol use disorder. But in other places, I've seen five being the minimum threshold. According to Dr. Cheng, he said that the information Jabari presented during her assessment would indicate that she is at risk for alcohol abuse disorder. Whether that means that she can be classified as an alcoholic is unclear to me personally. I know that we've touched on the subject a few times in these recaps because there definitely has been a suggestion that she might be an alcoholic. But from this, it does not look to me like there's enough information to concretely slap that label on her. But we can comfortably say that she has been identified by medical personnel as having a pattern of drinking beyond what is considered healthy. Now that might be too bland of a description for some people, but in my opinion, we have to be careful when we're making these kinds of conclusions. And that's true whether we're talking about majors, Jabari, or anyone else involved in these cases. Anyway, the next witness was Navid Sarwar, who I think many people were very interested in hearing from because he was the driver of the SUV that night when and where the alleged fight happened. Sarwar was testifying through an Urdu interpreter to ensure that he understood all the questions and also was giving proper and accurate answers to those questions, obviously. Anyway, he testified that he had been hired as Major's private driver for the day and evening. 
He apparently picked them up at 5 p.m. in Chelsea and drove them to the Brooklyn Academy of Music, or BAM for short, for an event before taking them to dinner. After they spent a few hours at dinner, he picked them up to take them home. When asked if they seemed intoxicated after dinner, he said no. And he said that everything seemed fine until Jabari noticed a text message on Major's phone. He said Jabari became angry and that she and Major started arguing. Starwar testified, I was taking them to Manhattan, and when we reached Canal and Bowery Street, the girl said, I want to see something on your phone. When asked about her demeanor, Starwar said she wanted to see a message, some message. And then he said the guy said there is nothing, but the girl was insisting. Side note, based on the language that he's using to identify Majors and Jabari, it sounds like he's really not all that familiar with them. To me, that suggests that he might not be regularly employed by Majors particularly, which is potentially important for analyzing potential bias by the witness. I didn't really touch on this earlier with witnesses like Chloe Zoller and Max Manning, but bias is always a potential factor to consider here with lay witnesses like this. If you've been following this channel for a while, you may have watched the Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash trial with us. In that trial, the plaintiff sued the actress for an alleged ski collision. He said she ran into him, but she said that he was the one to run into her. And there was apparently one eyewitness to the collision who was a friend of the plaintiff. He testified in favor of the plaintiff supporting the argument that Paltrow ran into him. However, on cross-examination, it was revealed that he didn't really see the collision and he was a little bit too bendy with the facts. And oh, by the way, he also was colorblind, so he couldn't really tell where Gwyneth Paltrow's ski clothes ended and where the plaintiff's ski clothes began. He seemed very well-meaning and I'm perfectly willing to believe that he just felt badly for his friend and wanted to support him. And maybe he even sincerely believed in what he was testifying. But sometimes the proximity of the relationship between the witness and the party involved can prove to be a problem for the case. So here, when we're looking at potential bias, when I hear Sarwar calling them the guy and the girl, this actually signals to me that he probably doesn't even really know who these two people are. And analyzing for bias, that's at least one thing. Now, when asked what he observed of this altercation, he said the girl became very angry at this time. He said he was looking straight, but feeling that something is going on in the back seat behind him. Next, he said, when I reached canals and center, the boy wanted to get rid of the girl and he opened the door. The boy came out of the car. Next, the prosecutor played security footage of the SUV at this intersection. And this is where I can mention that yesterday during the trial, the court released a bunch of photos and videos and audio recordings of the evidence in this trial. So for the first time, I was able to see a bunch of this stuff for myself rather than having to rely on other people's characterizations of this evidence. So here's the surveillance footage of them getting out of the car. The state asked, what did you see when the defendant opened the car? And so were answered, I saw that they were fighting amongst themselves. Then the state asked, what if anything was the defendant doing at that time? And so were answered, he was trying to get rid of her. He was saying, leave me alone. I have to go. And then the state asked what was happening and Sarwar answered he was not doing anything she was doing things then the state asked what if anything did you see the defendant do and Sarwar answered he was trying to throw her in the car and then when pressed for more details he said I do remember the boy was pushing her back into the car to get rid of her he was trying to push her into the car when asked how many times he said that I don't know then he said that after they got out he called his booker who instructed him to wait for them so that he could take them home not long after that he saw them standing on the sidewalk and Jabari was yelling at Majors in an argument. When asked if he ever saw Jabari hitting Majors, he said that he was looking at the road, but he had a feeling that she had hit him because of the way that she was fighting and the sounds that were being produced. Now, this is a little bit of a mixed bag for the defense and the prosecution. The part that helps the prosecution is, of course, him testifying to actually seeing Majors push Jabari back into the car. However, it's interesting that the language that he used was words like push as opposed to slam, for example. However, regardless, there is contact between them, which he is testifying to actually having seen himself. Now, on the other hand, the defense is helped here by the fact that the driver says that it basically sounded like she was the one that was hitting him while in the back seat. Granted, his testimony is limited on that point because of the fact that he said that he was watching the road, he wasn't looking in the rear view mirror, for example. So, you know, there, like I said, there is a limitation on that. But his indication is that it sounds like from what he's saying, his impression from that experience was that she was the one that was being aggressive towards him while in the car. So like I said, 
mixed bag for both sides on this direct examination. And given the fact that he is a witness for the prosecution, I don't know that that necessarily is particularly helpful to the prosecution. But I don't know, maybe you have a different opinion. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Now on cross-examination, the defense kept this very short and you guys know how much I love a short cross-examination. Apparently only a few questions were asked here, but one of them was important for the defense to get out. Particularly, the defense asked Sarwar whether he ever found any blood in his vehicle after that night. And his answer was no. Now this is important specifically for the allegation about the ear laceration. And now that we have photos of the injuries in question, we can see that the cut behind her ear is really, really deep. My layperson, non-expert opinion of that cut is it looks like something that was created with a very sharp object. And the absence of blood inside the car could suggest that it wasn't caused by contact with some part of the car's interior. Could it still have been cut inside the car? Sure, the answer to the defense's question about blood inside the car on its own doesn't eliminate that possibility. But if this cut did happen inside the car, then I would expect it to have been caused by some other object inside the car maybe on Major's person. But given the fact that the prosecution hasn't given some kind of theory or suggestion as to what that object would have been, it seems like there still is a gap in the prosecution's case on that specific point. But that's all I've got for day six. If you're watching this, you probably are already aware that closing arguments are happening, or maybe the jury's even deliberating at this point from when you're watching it, or maybe they've already reached a verdict. Regardless, what do you think of the evidence at this point? Let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more trial recaps like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.